Welcome to Creative Solutions for a New World Climate and Artist Series. I'm Frances Lippman, your host. Happy Earth Week, too. I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Coast Salish people of this region and First Nations worldwide. For thousands of years, the abundance that these lands and waters provide us to live, work, and play is due to the reciprocal relationships by which Coast Salish and the world's first people have lived and live today. We'll answer questions live closer to the end of this program. So feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have a question you would like answered. Introducing our first guest today will be our esteemed climate and the arts partner, Jonathan O'Reardon. John is a former Deputy Minister of the Environment dedicated to supporting climate action and the arts while honoring his late wife, professional cellist, Gail O'Reardon. Welcome, John. Thank you, Francis. Before I introduce Bob Sanford, I'd like to make a few comments about the extraordinary times that I feel we're experiencing on the road to carbon neutrality. This journey starts out with despair, but ends with hope. I despair when I hear that the level of carbon in the atmosphere is now over 200, 420 parts per million. I despair when I hear that the World Meteorological Organization says that 2020 will be the warmest year on record following the warmest decade on record. I despair when I hear that the ocean has the highest heat content on record. And I despair when I hear that the Arctic Ocean sheet is projected to be the lowest recorded level this summer. And I particularly despair when the International Energy Agency states that the annual increase in global CO2 emissions for 2021 is expected to be highest on record following the surge after the financial crisis of 2010. Have we learned nothing from history? I despair when I hear that coal-fired plants are continuing to be built across the Asia and China. And I despair that even though Canada set a new carbon emissions reduction target of 36% below 20, 2005 levels, it has invested $12 billion in the expansion of the trans Canada pipeline to pour 900,000 barrels of oil from Alberta into Asia. And I despair when I hear they see the last of our old growth forests being cut down, thus removing 300 years of stored carbon. And I also learned that in the five years since the Paris Agreement, the world's 60 largest banks invested over $3.8 trillion into the fossil fuel industry. It is always darkest before the dawn, so there is always hope. Tomorrow, Earth Day, will be the first day of this new dawn. I have hope that on Earth Day tomorrow, President Biden will meet with the 40 largest carbon producing nations and forge a new international collaboration. He, is, he will also announce a new carbon reduction target for the US and has already found grounds to collaborate with China. I have hoped that Mark Carney today announced that banks, insurance companies, and financial investors have banded together to invest $70 trillion in assets to accelerate a low carbon economy. I have hoped that a number of countries, including Canada, have pledged to increase the area of conservation to 25% of their lands and oceans by 2025 to protect, to protect biodiversity and increase carbon sequestration. To quote Shakespeare from Julius Caesar, there is a tide in the affairs of man, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shadows and in miseries. On such a full sea, we are now afloat and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. Earth Day 2021 marks the beginning of the flood tide. It will be sweeping in by November 21 with the UN summit and will continue to surge forward over the decades as the new initiative bear fruit. Community are in hope and finally push their national leaders to transform the way we live. Dawn will break in 2021 and the next three decades will be the most exhilarating ride mankind has ever, ever experienced. The essence of hope is telling the truth. We all have to realize that the emperor has no clothes. We can no longer hide behind the false statements of or not being prepared to face reality. Once we all understand the facts, 
we can have a serious conversation about creative solutions. Our guest today will tell us the reality of climate change in the Arctic and what can be done to mitigate this change. There are enormous consequences arising from the extraordinary warming of the Arctic with global implications on climate and biodiversity. There is no better, better group of experts to inform us on the truth and reality of these changes than our panel today. The members have a unique expertise in combining science to make their presentation all the more power powerful. The panel is led by Bob Sanford, Chair of the United Nations University Center for Global Water Futures and an award-winning author. He has direct links with the world's leading scientists and is eminently positioned to tell us the reality of climate crisis in the Arctic. Bob, over to you and your panel. Well, thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you, Francis, for the Earth Day opportunity to talk again about water and climate and to demonstrate why cold matters, not just in terms of creating a stable climate in this country, but in the entire Western Hemisphere. To begin, let's look quickly at how cumulative and compounding human effects are making sustainability a moving target here and where we live in Canada. Here are some of the effects that we need to stabilize if we don't want adaptation and resilience to be constantly beyond reach. Even before climate became an issue, we had already begun altering the global hydrologic cycle through rapid and expansive alteration of land use and cover. More than half of the entire surface of the planet and much of Canada has been significantly altered by human activities. Land use and cover changes, however, are only the beginning of the effects human activities are having on the global hydrologic cycle. Life on this planet is made possible by all the ways in which water reacts with nearly every element in the physical world. Some parameters, however, have more influence than others over the nature and function of any given hydroclimatic circumstance. Changes in temperature, for example, cascade through all other biogeochemical parameters. And the most frightening discovery of this young century is that this is exactly what is happening. The rate and manner in which water moves through the global hydrologic cycle is accelerating. And it's been difficult even for experts to grasp the full extent of what the loss of relative hydrologic stability actually means. Some 52 million cubic kilometers of water are being cyclically redistributed at any given moment through the global hydrologic cycle. What we've discovered is that 10 trillion metric tons of water are shifted from one hemisphere to the other in the form of winter snow cover during only one annual seasonal cycle. And what we're discovering is that the ratio of snow to liquid water in the great seasonal redistribution of precipitation in the northern hemisphere is changing with huge potential consequences for all of us. And nowhere is that more evident than here in Canada's Mountain West. Because of warming, we are expected to lose over 90% of the ice that exists in the interior ranges of Canada's Western mountains by the end of this century. It should be noted, however, that the loss of glacial ice is a symptom of a much larger problem. The same warming that is causing our glaciers to disappear so quickly is reducing snowpack and the duration and extent of snow cover throughout the Mountain West. By the mid-century, the Canadian West could be as much changed by this as it was by European settlement. Warming atmospheric temperatures directly affect how much water the global atmosphere can transport. And we've known for more than a century that for every degree Celsius of warming, we can expect the atmosphere to carry 7% more water vapor. And if we raise the temperature of the atmosphere by four degrees, it will carry 28% more water vapor. We would be then living on a different planet. So remember this relation. The clausius clapeyron relation is proving to be a critical driver in climate disruption. We are witnessing extraordinary changes in the global hydrologic cycle. The rapid melting of so much glacial ice is creating more liquid water which is evaporating faster into a warmer atmosphere, which is capable of transporting more water. More water vapor in the atmosphere is making storms more powerful, heat waves more intense, and drought deeper and more persistent. And that is why recently identified phenomena such as atmospheric rivers demand our full attention. 
Atmospheric rivers have likely existed for an eternity, but only now because of satellite remote sensing do we know of their existence and full dynamics. Atmospheric rivers have been called horizontal hurricanes. Since we discovered the presence of atmospheric rivers, climate change has been described as a tsunami in the sky. Keeping up with these changes will require a mindset shift. We need to start thinking of the colossal energy, mass, and biogeochemical exchanges between the oceans, the atmosphere, land, snow, ice, and water that power that system as a planetary freshwater source and a driver of the global climate cycle. What we're also seeing in the Arctic is that the loss of Arctic sea ice and the rapid reduction of the extent and duration of snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere are reducing the temperature gradient between the pole and the tropics. It's this difference in temperature between the polar region and the warmer air to the south that largely defines the behavior of the jet stream. The less ice there is in the Arctic, the slower and wavier the jet stream becomes and the more erratically it behaves. And we see from the altered behavior of the jet stream that warmer atmospheric temperatures do not automatically translate into warmer weather. In a uniformly warmer and therefore more turbulent atmosphere, both warm and cold fronts end up and persist in places in the mid latitudes in which they were not common in the past. And there's a growing realization of the extent to which Arctic sea ice acts as a thermostat controlling climate right down to the mid latitudes throughout the Northern Hemisphere. We've also discovered that there are tipping points widely in natural systems, including the climate system. Everything stays relatively stable through a range of changing conditions until an invisible threshold is crossed, then the dynamics of the system change completely. We don't know enough about the Earth system to know where all the tipping points are. And these feedback loops are creating themselves faster than science can keep up. Our greatest fear is that we won't know where they are until we've already crossed them. And if a threshold in one system is crossed, there's also a possibility of a ripple effect causing thresholds in other systems to be crossed too. The importance of this has yet to been realized. We are reaching the point at which we should no longer simply say that adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by way of our emissions is warming the planet. Instead, we have to say that the carbon dioxide, which we have already added to the atmosphere, has already warmed our planet to the point where feedback processes themselves are increasing the effect of these emissions. And that's exactly what we are fearing is happening in our own Arctic. Well, recent research suggests that we don't have to worry yet about massive releases of methane from the floor of warming polar seas. The greenhouse release feedback caused by permafrost in our Arctic has the potential to become a tipping point for the entire global climate. Scientists call it Arctic amplification. Because of unprecedented warming in the past two decades, the staggering scale of thawing of permafrost has turned the Arctic into a carbon source instead of a carbon sink. As one scientist put it, because of permafrost thaw, the Arctic has become an enormous carbon chimney. And this is a feedback we don't want to get away on us. We need to keep that carbon where it is in the ground. And it's not just what's happening on land in the Arctic that should concern us. Researchers on board a drifting observatory for the study of Arctic climate have found that under the sea ice, the Arctic Ocean is a gigantic heat system bringing energy from the south Thinner ice will impact this under ice heating system, which will accelerate climate change. Mosaic researchers also found that for now, the Arctic Ocean, unlike many other warming oceans around the world, still fully absorbs carbon dioxide and generates a great deal of oxygen. Will that still be so if we warm the Arctic Ocean? We simply don't know. And that's why what happened early in April of this year should be of great concern to all of us. On Wednesday, April 7th, 2021, NASA made it widely known that on Saturday, April 3rd, carbon dioxide concentrations in the global atmosphere 
which have been accurately and reliably measured for the last 65 years on Mauna Loa in Hawaii, for the first time in the entire history of humanity, exceeded 420 parts per million. This despite being the second year of a pandemic that has slowed human activity to such an extent that it reduced carbon dioxide emissions by as much as 4% globally. The carbon dioxide concentration in the global atmosphere on April 3rd was an astonishing 421.21 parts per million. So what does this mean and why does it matter? Well, the reason this matters is that it means that self-reinforcing feedbacks re originating in the accelerating carbon emissions from what we were previously carbon sinks like the Arctic will continue to increase independent of how much we as a society reduce our emissions, which means we need to decarbonize our society even faster over the next decade than we are presently proposing. And it's for that reason that Canada must take its responsibility for dramatically reducing our country's carbon footprint seriously when it submits its national net zero plan at the UN's next convention of the parties scheduled to be held in Glasgow this November. Canada should unfold its plan in lockstep with the new net zero plan developed by the Biden administration. All national plans, however, have to demonstrate that we have reached the most important tipping point of all, our tipping point, the point at which enough of us see that we are at a point of no return with respect to climate disruption and finally take collective action before it threatens to end our prosperity. And I believe as John Reardon does that that moment could be now. And it's in that realization that hope resides. And from this, we see that in terms of our climate, in terms of the global climate, cold really does matter. It is now my very great honor to once again introduce one of this country's most respected statesmen and public policy scholars. Dr. Thomas Axworthy has a lifetime of experience in the Arctic. He's one of the Arctic's uh, Council architects of the Arctic Council and has been tracking concerns associated with accelerating permafrost thaw in terms of how it is impacting Northern peoples and cultures in Canada and the geopolitics throughout the circumpolar Arctic. Over to you, Dr. Axworthy, thank you. Well, thank you and, uh, and thank you for uh, inviting me on to this important discussion and with this very good group which wants to use uh, art and, and some of the higher dimensions of life to try to focus people's attentions on this incredibly difficult set of issues that you've enunciated so well. Um, if I could sum up my presentation in one sentence, and you can turn me off then after that, <laughs> it's that uh, the permafrost is no longer very permanent. Uh, it's not perma anymore. It's thawing. And that has got uh, enormous implications, as Bob has just shown in his slides. And I want to spend a little time on the permafrost issue in particular, because unlike uh, the sea ice issue that Bob just talked about and climate change in uh, general, the permafrost dimension in the Arctic receives less attention than many other aspects of this, of this uh, compli uh, complicated set of issues. But its implications are absolutely pr profound and, uh, and uh, staggering. With all the uh, problems that we have with uh, current CO2 and climate change. If the permafrost, which makes up 65% of Russia's land mass, 50% of Canada's, uh, which is the, uh, the world's largest carbon sink at the moment, if it continues to melt, uh, to thaw at its current rate, uh, an absolutely gigantic amount of uh, CO2 and, uh, and uh, methane, as Bob has said, will be released into the atmosphere. Uh, there are something like 1,400 to 1,700 gigatons uh, already, you know, in that uh, frozen soil. 
And that's more than twice as much as the current uh, CO2 in our atmosphere. Now, if a large proportion of that uh, permafrost, uh, the, uh, the gases that are there, the organic matter, are released into our atmosphere, then we've just compounded our current problems by an enormous degree. And that permafrost degradation is happening. Uh, we know uh, across the Arctic now, there are uh, what are called slumps or uh, land uh, landslides as the, as the ground uh, thaws. Uh, then it has uh, uh, lakes begin to disappear. Uh, there was a famous case in the Northwest Territories not long ago that a, a lake which was buffeted by a hill uh, which had been frozen for millennia, uh, the hill uh, thawed and the water gushed out, uh, absolutely draining the lake. Um, thousands of gallons of water lost and turned as it mixed into the mud of the thawing of, uh, of uh, permafrost into sludge. And uh, uh, Bob Sanford uh, has worked with me in the past when I was uh, uh, president of the Gordon Foundation, which concentrates on the, uh, on the Arctic and on the North on a series of uh, work uh, studies and films about the Mackenzie River Delta, this, 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 these great lungs of the North American continent. Well, projections are that the, over 15,000 lakes in the Mackenzie Delta could be lost uh, through the uh, permafrost uh, thawing. So this is an enormous, enormous issue. And, and uh, in addition, uh, not just to keep bringing up problem after problem, but we do have to understand how critical the permafrost dimension is. In, in addition to uh, the methane and the, uh, and the CO2 that Bob has talked about that is going into the atmosphere. So what used to be a, a, a sink is now a motor of, of, uh, of climate change. Uh, there are also pathogens and viruses um, that had been frozen for a very long time uh, in that permafrost, which may also be uh, released. Uh, I went to a series of uh, scientific briefings at Woods Hill in Massachusetts, where uh, they concentrated on the potential impacts on disease, on, on diseases that had been frozen uh, for uh, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and th those are kind of science fiction scary, potentially, if they emerge into our atmosphere. And it's not just Simon uh, fiction. 2016 in Russia, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on Russia. Uh, 2016, um, uh, anthrax was re released uh, uh, in Siberia, uh, in some communities through permafrost um, thaw. Uh, 70 people were hospitalized several thousand reindeer died. Uh, and I want to turn to uh, Russia for a second because I've also been asked then to talk about the international dimension of politics and potential cooperation to deal with permafrost. And here, Russia and Canada are the two uh, overwhelmingly important players. Uh, but Russia shows what happens when permafrost uh, it gets, be, begins this enormous thawing that we are witnessing. Uh, Norilsk is one of the largest uh, cities uh, built on permafrost in Siberia. Uh, it has had a series of problems that show the accelerating issue. Um, something like 50 to 60 percent of the houses in that city have been damaged by uh, permafrost thaw. 10% have been abandoned. And just last summer in May, uh, to show the potential impacts, an oil storage depot simply collapsed. Uh, the permafrost went out from under it and it collapsed, sending uh, thousands of tons of uh, oil into a nearby river. Um, the river turned red uh, 
through the uh, the toxins and the sludge that was put into it. And uh, it will take about a decade to clean up uh, 10 billion Russian rubles. The, uh, the uh, Russians immediately um, began, they say, uh, an inventory of all important infrastructure in Russia that is uh, liable to have uh, decay because of the permafrost uh, thaw. Uh, but that begins to show you that a, a city itself be uh, has begun to collapse. And we have had uh, nothing on that scale, but in Tuktoyaktok in Alaska and many other places, um, the, uh, the permafrost uh, thaw is affecting where people live, infrastructure is collapsing, bridges are collapsing. Uh, nothing quite as dramatic though as the, as the um, oil uh, depot collapse last uh, last May. So what can we begin to do about it? And John and others have talked about some optimism in moving forward. So uh, looking at the two superpowers and their work on the uh, within the Arctic Council, we can say this. First of all, we hope in the Arctic on permafrost and sea ice and all the issues that Bob has talked about, that we will see as large a change in Arctic policy with the Biden administration um, as we have, uh, as we've all hoped for uh, in generally in the United States uh, leadership around climate change. Uh, it, it couldn't be worse with the Trump administration. Um, the, their Secretary of State came and uh, actually threatened to uh, Canada's Northwest Passage. Uh, uh, attacking us uh, uh, in the same light as uh, examples of the South China Sea. So rather than cooperating with Canada, was threatening um, us directly, which was what this administration was prone to do. Um, uh, the United States ha itself has got uh, 21 military installations in Alaska. The, uh, the Northern Warning System is there. Uh, these are all installations that are potentially subject to the same kind of decline on permafrost. So the United States should be interested and Canada should be able to work out a joint Arctic research policy with the Biden administration. I hope that the Arctic is a major uh, part of cooperation between our two countries. And then we get to Russia, the, uh, the real superpower in the, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, at Massey College, where we have had a series of webinars and work, on permafrost and the Arctic. A very good idea by Franklin Grifford, a very well noted political scientist and expert on Russia, is that it would make a lot of sense for Canada to suggest a joint Canadian Arctic task force uh, working together on uh, permafrost. What are the best mitigation techniques? What technologies do we have? Can installations be reinforced by uh, steel? Are there techniques to really refrigerate uh, pieces of the permafrost. It sounds odd that you're talking about refrigerating uh, the Arctic, but keeping the temperature uh, below uh, 32 is very important for keeping those gases and methane and those pathogens uh, in the ground. Or is there techniques that we could look at together jointly in, uh, in dealing uh, with permafrost in particular? So there are the large global issues of uh, climate change. Within that, there's a sub area of how to deal with permafrost. Now, it is, I'm gonna end, I think, on an optimistic note that uh, it is obviously very difficult to talk about specific cooperation with Russia uh, at this particular geopolitical time. Uh, thousands of soldiers are massing on Ukraine's borders. Russia has been a very difficult player uh, in the last uh, several years, uh, there have been uh, interferences in American elections, potentially Canadian elections. This is a under President Putin. This is a very difficult country to cooperate with. But back in the uh, 80s, um, Canada began to to cooperate in the right in the height of the Cold War. Uh, by bringing together scientists and through that scientific cooperation and bringing together artists as well. Uh, the travelers used to go to the Soviet Union and the Bolshoi would come here. There was a very 
active artistic exchange between our two countries and scientific cooperation between our two countries. And out of those seeds emerged the cooperation that eventually led to the Arctic Council, which is uh, uh, designed to use science to preserve the environment of the Arctic. So we, we have in historical example in a very similar difficult geopolitical era that in the Arctic, the nations found a way to cooperate and create a new institution. We now need it again, and we need it more than ever to deal with permafrost. Thank you very much, Dr. Axworthy. As, as always, very insightful. One of the principal themes of this webinar series is the acknowledgement that while completely understandable to other scientists that Charts, graphs, and numbers don't always move people, but art does. And you've applied, uh, you've referred to that too, Dr. Exworthy. And one of the most remarkable elements of the Global Water Futures Program is it embraces art as a means of communicating the water and climate story. And Dr. Louise Arnella is remarkable that she lives in both worlds. She's both a scientist and an artist, and she's the genius behind a groundbreaking new approach of, to marrying art and science. And she and her artists call this the virtual art gallery. In her session, Dr. Arnell will introduce a climate scientist, Dr. Jen Baltzer, who's an expert on permafrost, and artist um, uh, Ryan Bryn Jolson, with whom she's working directly to make scientific research findings more understandable outside of the climate science community. Over to you, Dr. Arnell. Thank you very much for the introduction, Bob. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak at this uh, event. This is a very exciting opportunity. So I'd like to talk, um, as you already uh, introduced, the Virtual Water Gallery. Uh, I am a co-curator of the Virtual Water Gallery together with Martin Clark, Stacey Dumanski, and John Pomeroy. And the Virtual Water Gallery is a science and art pilot project that is a part of the Global Water Futures program. So a bit about the context behind uh, why we started the Virtual Water Gallery. As you all know, water is life. And so water related challenges such as droughts, floods, or freshwater availability affect everyone. And we believe that by sharing water perspectives across communities of artists, of scientists, of indigenous peoples and many other communities, it can help find creative and holistic solutions to the water challenges that we all face and that we have heard about uh, already a bit before now. So art can also add an emotional dimension to these sometimes cold, hard scientific facts that, uh, and Bob Sanford mentioned that and this last year, the pandemic also highlighted the value of human connections. And so with this project, we really wanted to create an online space to foster these human connections in tackling or talking about these water challenges. So the Virtual Water Gallery is a science and art pilot project that brings together artists, water experts, knowledge keepers, and the public to, to co together collectively reflect on these water challenges that affect us all. It's a project that is funded by the Global Water Futures program, as I already mentioned, and Global Water Futures is one of the largest university-led water programs in the world. And together, 12 artists and 16 water experts and knowledge keepers, keepers have co-explored water challenges across various Canadian ecoregions, river basins, and also their communities. That includes the Arctic, mountains, prairies, boreal forests, and farmlands. And at the bottom here, I've put a few snapshots of some of the beautiful pieces that have been co-created as part of this project. This also includes five external science and art projects that we'll be also showcasing on the Virtual Water Gallery because we have uh, similar aims. On the third photo here, on the first row, you will see artist Gennady Ivanov. And Gennady Ivanov has been collaborating with professors Trevor Davies in the UK and John Pomeroy here in Canada to together look at uh, cold regions warming through an artistic and a scientific lens. And this doesn't only contain to Canada, 
They've been looking at climate change and its impact in the circ circumpolar north, and that also includes Russia as well as Canada. Um, another actor that is very important as part of this virtual water gallery is the public. And the public will be able to engage via a discussion tool on the online gallery with these beautiful pieces that have been created as part of the project. You'll be able to see a lot more of the gallery on this brand new website here that I put a link to at the bottom, virtualwatergallery.ca. But for now, I'd like to introduce two collaborators that Bob Sanford already uh, started introducing. And they've been collaborating together on a project called Life Support as part of the Virtual Water Gallery. Artist Ryan Brynjolsson, who is also an author, book illustrator, and art educator. And Professor Jennifer Bolter, who is the Canada Research Chair in Forests and Global Change, and an expert in the impacts of climate-driven disturbances on subarctic ecosystems, including permafrost thaw. So I'll leave it to you now to talk about your projects. Thank you, Louise, and I'm delighted to join this wonderful panel today and excited to have had the opportunity to be part of the virtual water gallery. As Bob and Tom have highlighted, climate warming is leading to the loss of cold at, at, at high latitudes. And this loss of cold is leading to rapid and widespread land cover change. These changes were the focus of the science art collaboration that Ryan and I have been working on as part of the Global Water Futures virtual water gallery. Um, as Bob has just shared, high latitude regions of, the, regions of the planet are warming incredibly fast, in fact, three to four times faster than the global mean. This means that we're already seeing the effects of climate warming playing out across the north. This figure shows some of the major changes that are happening in response to amplified warming. In the boreal, we see forests succumbing to drought. We see wildfires that are occurring with greater frequency and severity, affecting boreal forests in novel ways and increasingly impacting tundra ecosystems. We see species distribution shifting. Insect pests are expanding their reach where extreme winters have previously excluded them and tall shrubs are expanding onto previously open tundra. Finally, we see loss of ice and snow. These changes in the earth's surface have the potential to feed back to the climate system through various processes, some of which we understand very well. And Bob and Tom have highlighted some of those and some of which we are just discovering. Boreal and Arctic landscapes store massive amounts of carbon and fresh water and changes to the land cover at such a vast scale has large impacts in the climate system, but also for local communities. So when Ryan and I started developing our collaboration, we decided on the theme of Arctic landscapes as life support, an idea that applies both to the local communities who live in these areas and for the planet. Rapid change in these faraway cold places affects us all. What happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. Before you view some of Ryan's work, I just wanted to walk you through what some of these changes look like on, look like on the ground. So wow. permafrost, as, as Tom and Bob have both mentioned, is, is perennially frozen ground. Climate warming and associated disturbances are causing permafrost to thaw throughout the circumpolar north. And where thaw occurs rapidly, the implications can be dramatic and have destructive effects on the associated ecosystems. Here are two examples of these rapid thaw processes. So on the left is a lowland thermokarst feature where thaw results in um, ground subsidence. So the ground surface lowers and, and the soils become waterlogged. Ultimately, this leads to forest, forest cover loss and expansion of wetlands with big changes in both the hydrology and the carbon dynamics of the system, as well as value for wildlife, travel on the land, et cetera. On the right is an incredible example that Tom already mentioned of a mass wasting event. Permafrost thaw causes the active layer to become unstable and results in slope failure. In this case, not only did the surface sediment that you see sliding down slope end up in the river, but the lake wall was breached and it led to a rapid flooding event. In addition to permafrost thaw, climate warming is increasing fuels on the landscape. This is resulting in more frequent, widespread and severe wildfires throughout the north. Here we see a, wild, a wall of fire and smoke moving across a very wet landscape that is typically not terribly flammable. But when we have multi-year droughts combined, combined with warming temperatures, this becomes possible. These wildfires have several immediate consequences. First, they release tremendous amounts of carbon to the atmosphere. This particular fire year that, that's depicted in these pictures, it was in the NWT and in the Northwest Territories in Canada, and it released half as much carbon as all of Canada's natural lands take up in a year. And some of this carbon was very old, hundreds of, year, hundreds of years old, in fact. 
There are also immediate and longer term consequences for water quality and hydrology. In the longer term, fire accelerates permafrost thaw and severe burning can alter successional trajectories of the recovering forest. These land cover changes alter many ecosystem services. When we imagine water moving through these landscapes as we see in the image on the left, it's easy to envision how changes in land cover, changes in permafrost conditions will alter the amount and the quality of water flowing out of the system and will alter the carbon fluxes from that system. These processes support a variety of ecosystems and the communities that, that live on these lands um, and ultimately impact the planet as a whole. The same, um, we, we can think of many different ecosystem services that, that are impacted by these changes and have planetary consequences. And this includes the carbon fluxes that we've heard a lot about today already. For communities who hunt and fish and live on these lands, their culture, livelihoods, and well being are being directly impacted. There's an urgent need to act rapidly and collectively to reduce emissions, to slow these changes for Arctic communities and for the world. I'll now turn, turn it over to Ryan to share her artist, artistic representation of these changes. Thank you. So as Jen mentioned, we conceived the idea for our project of life support. Life support seemed to be a rich metaphor that leverages the immediately accessible pandemic imagery of intensive care units, ventilators, and hospital settings, and the realization that mm. we're part of a global system and vulnerable to global events. Life support is also the land we live on, the land that supports life, the thin thread that ties us to food security, water security, and the air we breathe. We've become so civilized, so citified, that we sometimes forget that we're animals, that we rely on other animals and plants for food and oxygen, that we also require healthy ecosystems, healthy watersheds, and clean air. Thawing permafrost affects northern life supports, northern food security and water security. As forests and land cover vegetation changes, animals' behavior and ability to thrive will also change, including animals that have been traditionally hunted for food. Permafrost thaw causes runoff that releases organic matter, turning clean water into something that looks like cowboy coffee. It releases contaminants like mercury into fresh water, affecting fish stocks and drinking water. As I began to engage with the research, the first thing that caught my attention were drunken trees. Jen explained that as permafrost thaws, the ground sinks and becomes boggy. Trees begin to tilt, then topple over. Forests become lowland bogs. As water runs off, lakes can dry up or waterways may become connected and collect in a new basin the whole boreal system. I watched video interviews with researchers who gathered the data, and I developed a real respect for these young people who live in remote areas on the edge of mosquito-infested bogs for extended periods. So I began to study their research and their unique perspectives. One of these projects was mapping a plot of 40,000 trees on a grid to see how forests are changing over time. Researcher Catherine Dearborn was shocked by the changes she saw, discovering that many trees had been completely absorbed into the bog within a five-year time frame. She said, because permafrost in the area is thawing so rapidly, I found that a lot of trees growing at the edge had died and fallen over into surrounding wetlands. In fact, sometimes I found myself looking at my map of the plot and thinking, there should be a tree here when there was just wetlands. One time I even reached into the peat moss where a tree should have been and found it had been completely buried in the last five years. So the rate at which these changes were happening was really shocking to me. You can see in the painting that the data and grid lines are overlaid on the landscape. I sometimes had trouble deciphering the academic papers and began to think about how to illustrate the data so that I could picture what was happening. This painting combines data from a plot grid with an image of a collapsed scar bog. Northern Water Futures also studies the effects of fire and plant regrowth and regeneration in boreal forests. Fires are hotter, cover more territory, and burn more often now. Fires burn peat moss and ground cover, blackening the ground and causing permafrost to thaw even more quickly. Fires that are enhanced by a warmer, drying climate will in turn accelerate global warming. It's interesting to hear scientists speak with passion, describing the beauty of the land they're studying and using words like shocking to describe what's happening as global temperatures rise and permafrost in the North thaws. 
Parks ecologist Tori Stevens, in an earlier Creatively United webinar, spoke about entering a period of global instability and the need to protect biodiversity. Louise Arnell suggested that it would be interesting to include citations with the artwork. So thanks, Louise. This is figure three from a paper titled Permafrost Thaw is Rapidly Altering Forest Community Composition by Dearborn Wallace, Patankar and Baltzer. Maybe this will start a new trend in citations with paintings. It's, it's worth reflecting on what is being lost in terms of biodiversity in the boreal forest. We are conditioned to think about forests in terms of resource or recreational use, but we should pause and also appreciate there is inherent beauty in those boreal systems that support an intricate and mystifying diversity of plants and creatures and fungi. If we lose biodiversity, we also lose beauty and complexity. It was a privilege to interact with other environmentally minded artists and to learn about their processes on this project and their emotional responses. Making art about the climate crisis, spending hours immersed in the subject matter and in images of devastation is an emotional undertaking. And I imagine that's equally true for the scientists who confront the reality of climate change daily and face the challenge of how to make people care and for the activists who engage directly against climate change denial. So I hope these conversations between artists and scientists can help us imagine scenarios more, more fully, utilize surprising metaphors that jolt us out of our comfort zones and outdated patterns of thinking, provide images that depict the seriousness of what the data is revealing and the heartbreaking beauty of what is being lost and they can open up new paradigms or new ways of seeing our relationship to our planet and our connectedness to the natural world. Thanks. I'd like to um, invite everyone to learn more about the Virtual Water Gallery and uh, to thank Ryan and Jennifer for this inspiring project and presentation. So if you want to hear about other projects that have been going on as part of the Virtual Water Gallery, I invite you all to join the launch on the 29th of April uh, at these times here that you can see, and you can register on the globalwaterfutures.ca website or directly on our virtualwatergallery.ca website. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, all of you, for a marvelous presentation and demonstrating how critical the relationship between science and art can be and how much it can influence the way we think and see the world. If you've been following this webinar series, then you've it already been introduced to Washington, D.C. lawyer and political and social commentator, Mace Rosenstein. His contributions to this webinar series have been so much appreciated. We've, we've, we've created a moment of comment and conclusion of this section on how the theme truth matters can be applied to the challenge posed by accelerating permafrost thaw and other climate threats in the Arctic. And we've started calling this segment Mace's Climate Corner. So Mace, what did you find while tracking the truth and telling and the telling of this climate story? Over to you, Mace. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, I, I'm hoping that there's a way to marry the two concepts John was talking about, that is hope and despair. And that together we can continue to find a way to uh, to, to keep them in equipoise somehow in an uneasy union. And perhaps to, to illustrate that, that desire, I wanted to close our program today by uh, telling you a story of the Yamal Peninsula. The Yamal, as you can see, juts into the Kara Sea on the northern edge of Russia. And in the language of the native Nanuts people, Yamal means the end of the world. And it was here that the events of 2016 that Tom Axworthy mentioned earlier took place. The Yamal is remote and barren. It's mosquito infested in summer, plunged into endless night and winter when the temperature drops to minus 50 Celsius. Historically, the Nanuts people have been nomadic reindeer herders. They travel with their animals up and down the entire peninsula hundreds of miles each year. And during the unusually hot summer of 2016 that Tom mentioned, the Nanuts noticed that their reindeer were behaving oddly. The animals seemed sleepy, they said. They lay down, they began shaking and panting, they wouldn't move. Their ribs stuck out, 
their fur fell off, then they died. Initially, Russian government officials were unperturbed. They said reindeer can thrive in extreme cold, but they aren't adapted for temperatures that that summer rose to near 40 degrees Celsius. Historically, the high summer temperature on the Yamal is around 15. Only after thousands of reindeer deaths and reports that humans were falling sick too and the death of a child, did the authorities acknowledge that they were not dealing with heat stroke and that the sudden killer of reindeer was anthrax. Just two years before, in 2014, the Yamal had achieved another dubious distinction when Nanette's herders came across an immense sinkhole. It's now known that this crater is just one of many that have occurred across the peninsula over the last few years. Some deeper than a 20-story building is high. And as Bob and Tom discuss, scientists have now determined that the sinkholes result from pockets of methane that have been trapped in the permafrost under the Yamal for millennia, and that now are being released sometimes explosively as a result of rising temperatures. And of course, that's part of the climate feedback loop that Bob was discussing. We now know that climate change was the explanation for 2016's anthrax outbreak too. The corpses of reindeer infected with anthrax decades or centuries ago were preserved in the Yamal permafrost. And as the permafrost thaws, the mummified animals release the pathogens that killed them, which escape onto the landscape. Interestingly, without guidance from their government, the residents of Yamal sought their own explanation for the epidemic. Some said foreign agents had sprayed anthrax from helicopters in order to weaken Russia's defenses in the Arctic. Others said Gazprom was poisoning the reindeer to drive the Nanuts herders off the land. Still others said they simply didn't believe that anthrax existed. And as for the sinkholes, one popular theory on the Yamaha was that they were caused by UFOs. And we should note too, as others have mentioned, that not just anthrax spores lie below the permafrost of Yamal. The peninsula and its surrounding waters are the site of the world's largest known gas reserves. Gazprom pumps 67.5 billion cubic meters of gas from beneath the Yamal each year, with plans underway to expand to 360 billion. Climate change, Vladimir Putin said in 2017, climate change provides more favorable conditions for economic activity in this region. That was just a year after the reindeer had begun to die. As others have noted, it's not beyond possibility. And in fact, it may be likely that as permafrost thaw continues, other deadly infections of the past will recur. From beneath the Alaskan and Siberian tundra, scientists have recovered still active viruses for which our immune systems have no antibodies. Even eradicated diseases such as smallpox, like anthrax in the anthrax in the Yamal could be and definitely are preserved in the permafrost layer. Gennady Ivanov, who you heard mentioned earlier, has imagined this terrifying dystopia brilliantly in the image you're seeing now called permafrost thaw reunites distant cousins. Well, I like to be able to tell you that truth will always triumph. That's one of our themes on these webinars. But so long as industries and governments continue to exploit misinformation, silence, and our apathy, as they plunder the planet to satisfy our near-term appetites and protect their near-term economic interests, whether that's manifest as share price or GDP, then truth looks to be a victim along with reindeer. And as an old Nanuts woman told a reporter in the summer of 2016, if the reindeer start going, life itself will disappear. Compelling to say the least, Mace, thank you very, very much. Over to you, Francis. Well, geez, that was uh, beyond. 
I, I have to say, I'm just blown away. So thank you, Bob, for facilitating and bringing together this fascinating panel and uh, to all our panelists for sharing your brilliance. This is so vital that people know about this. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of time. We're gonna answer as many questions as we can, but we're coming up to the noon hour and I know people drop off. So we will include any questions we don't get answered with the video replay. We'll include the links and the information about these events will be on Creatively United. And we do have an event calendar. I highly recommend you all check out. And we do have a list of Earth Day events and Earth Week events and upcoming events. So um, one of the questions, uh, this one is, thank you for presenting this information as an indigenous person interning in geological consulting and studying land management. When you mentioned the permafrost melting underneath an oil storage facility previously, do you see a potential issue arising with the nuclear hydrogen storage facilities being proposed and built in indigenous communities in the north. Thank you. One of the uh, uh, dangers of um, the subject that we've been talking about is that uh, during the Cold War also uh, all kinds of substances were, uh, were buried in, in what authorities then thought was the permafrost where they would stay buried uh, forever. So I think I can be corrected, but I think I'm right. There's about 200 different sites in Canada's north that, that are directly related to former Cold War act activities. Some of them may even be radioactive. We don't quite know what's down there. And, and so uh, that's another danger that this country better look at, knowing where these sites are and what is in them and how we can remediate it uh, before they come about. And, uh, and certainly on um, any new installations that have as part of their plan storage in the permafrost is just a recipe for disaster. Everything that we have in the permafrost is thawing and is potentially gonna be put into our atmosphere. But we could have a real Cold War, remnants of the Cold War problem in Canada's North right now. I, I could add to that, Bob, as well. Um, in the Northwest Territories, there's a, a you know, this this is another another issue in addition to the nuclear issue, uh, mining contaminants that were buried in permafrost. And so, right on the shores of Great Slave Lake, there's a former gold mine where there's 250,000 tons of arsenic trioxide buried in what was presumably, you know, permanent permanently frozen ground. They're now having to actively freeze the ground around those stores to keep mm -hmm. that from being discharged into the environment. So, so these are really big issues that we're going to be facing as we move forward. Absolutely. And uh, it's, it's been asked, will there be a film version of the virtual water gallery, a documentary? That is a very exciting idea. Uh, we don't have plans for a documentary per se, but we're looking at plans to make some uh, in-focus videos about each of these projects. Great. And how does the Arctic compare to the Amazon forest with respect to their global benefit with respect to CO2? Can I speak to that one? Uh, I think it's quite interesting. I, I was the one that coined the phrase is that McKenzie is the cold yeah. Amazon. Cold Amazon. <laughs> That's right. And the reason uh, being is that it's such a very large system that has such a profound impact on the entire global climate system. And what's really interesting about that question is that uh, we know that uh, major ecosystems are teleconnected in ways that we never imagined before. And what is being put forward is that uh, uh, we, if we were able to save the Amazon, if we were able to preserve the Amazon, that might be a means of helping us refreeze the Arctic. That's how tightly connected these systems can be. So earth system and biodiversity restoration becomes central to uh, the whole project of slowing and coming to understand and managing uh, Arctic warming, but also changes in other parts of the earth system. So those are really interesting things. There is a link. Excellent. We have about six other questions, which I think we will answer with the video replay because we're really tight on time. But Earth Day is officially tomorrow. But just a reminder that every day is Earth Day on creativelyunited.org where you'll find all kinds of special events and celebration of Earth Week, but we're always on it. 
And uh, great news, I just wanna give everyone a quick update here. The deadline for saving Mountain Road Forest, a precious 49 acre forest in the heart of Saanich has been extended two months due to excellent public support for this special area. So thank you to everyone who's already contributed to the Habitat Trust fundraiser and Creatively United has a package with uh, Oswego Hotel, two nights there and a beautiful piece of art by acclaimed photographer, David Ellingson. So donate now, get a tax receipt and create a win-win. John, would you like to tell us more about what's coming up? Thanks, Francis. Yes, as Lewis said, uh, water is life. Next two weeks, we're going to be talking about the insecurity in our water resources across Canada as climate affects droughts, floods, water quality, and uh, forests that affect also the way we water is used. But we are going to talk about solutions. We're going to talk about work that's being done at the national level, the Canada Water Agency to bring science and monitoring to understand water better and prepare ourselves for a changing water future. And we're talking about a new pro set of programs in British Columbia involving Indigenous nations and the government to improve the way we manage our watersheds through a water security fund and strategy. So it's going to be an exciting and informative uh, webinar and we hope that you'll join us and learn a lot more as you did today. It's going to be fun. And thank you so much to all of you, our amazing panelists and our amazing audience for tuning in. And we'll see you in two weeks and we will get your questions answered. So tune in. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye for now. Bye.